Here's Bruce and Nathaniel Rateliff from GSI in New York. Every guitarist should just have to watch your right hand. You've got such a... Where did you learn to finger pick? I mean, I've done... It's a weird, almost like claw hammer style. Mm -hmm. um, which I think I just kind of... When I was younger, I used to do a lot of like sort of um, Almond Brothers kind of... <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd switch in between um, using a pick and then like doing double stops. So I'd just like fold my pick in between my pointer and my middle finger. Oh, really? And then at some point, that started to turn into that mm -hmm. thing. And then, yeah, so. But you've got, I mean, your, your bass notes, it's like a, like a train. But you've got the strum, and you, you're picking after the strum. It's really, it's doing a lot of work there. Thanks. You know, the other thing is I can't really Travis pick, which is essentially the same. The... Yeah, you can't? I can like fake it, but mm -hmm. not in the same. Yeah. I watch other people do it. I'm like, damn it, why haven't I figured that out yet? But, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that was fabulous. It just, it, there was just so much going on in that song. Oh, uh, thank you. So tell me about the song you just played for us. Um, well, that's the title track. The record was going to have, you know, that was that's the third title. The, originally, I was going to name it Rush On, but I thought that that was. A little too heavy, and being the title track, um, the listeners would be drawn to listen to that first. Uh, and then I was going to name it All or Nothing because I was so excited about accomplishing writing that song because it was a little, the structure of it was a lot more, is a, a little more in depth than I'm used to like digging into. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but then I was talking with a friend, and they're like, you know, I, I'm surprised you didn't name this record and it's still all right because it kind of sums up the whole record it you know it kind of you're talking about loss and um and heartache and but then trying to find joy you know like um and so that's yeah you know i talk a lot about um it's like a, a conversation with myself and then also with other people uh, throughout the song depending on which line it is you know so <laughs> People listening, a lot of them are going to know you from your work with Night Sweats. Right. Big, brassy, soulful uh, songs like SOB and You Worry Me. But this is really kind of returning to what you started doing before the Night Sweats. Uh, yeah, I had probably 10, maybe seven years, mm -hmm. seven years for sure of like, you know, just slumming it, you know, living, mm -hmm. living out of the van and trying to have a band with me. And I still... You know, a lot of the guys in the Night Sweats and this new project are from people who play with me from back in those days as mm -hmm. well. And you started, now your family, they were gospel singers, your mother and father. Yeah, my mom played in church uh, and my dad too, so it was a, kind of like a family band. Did but you I, did you have siblings that played in it as well? Uh, my, my sister, uh, mm -hmm. Heather, who's two years older than me, she played piano and sang. And then, you know, sometimes it would just be like my mom and dad. Uh, and then they would make me and my sister sing, so we'd have this like four part harmony. But it was certainly that era of like um, my mom and dad kind of came out of that like Jesus movement of the seventies and sixties. Mm -hmm. So more along the lines of like singer songwriter, um, folky kind of stuff. My mom played twelve string because I think some people okay. are like when you think of gospel, you think of like the staple singers or even like. The Oak Ridge Boys or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or I, I just feel like some people think that it's like the scene from, uh, you know, the Blues Brothers where James Brown is the pastor, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, especially when they think of the Night Sweats. I was like, no. Nah. I was like, I, I listened to all that on my own. My mom did something <laughs> totally different. But it was a good upbringing um, musically, you know. At least a, I had a great home for, and lots of encouragement to 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 play and to listen to music, you know. Mm -hmm. Like my, my dad and mom were always excited to like introduce something new to me, so. Really? In secular music as well? <clears throat> Not at first, but the, after my dad passed away, my mom sort of lightened up on the secular music. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad, you know, uh, unbeknownst to me, I had this like collection of secular music in the closet of all his old records. And so oh. um, I was able to like kind of go through that. And after he passed away, it also felt, made me feel like I had some sort of connection to him through those records. So so 
before he passed, you found the records, or did you find them afterwards? After. He started to lighten up a little bit, too, before he passed away. Um, you know, because they, they, they had some pretty... Uh, they were very young when they joined the church and had a lot of traumatic stuff happen in their lives that led them into that. And so as they started to get into their 30s, they started to lighten up a little bit, mm -hmm. you know. Um, did you yeah. Do you remember the first record you found? Um... I, yeah, I remember finding like Muddy Waters, um, folk singer, and Muddy Waters sings Big Bill Bronzy, yeah. and then like some of the other stuff. It was like um, there's some Moody Blues in there, um, <laughs> you know, some unexpected stuff because yeah. that was that era of music you listened to. But also, my dad just started to be a little more comfortable about listening to the radio, and I remember like Bob Dylan coming on and just like having my mind blown or hearing Imagine for the first time. And wondering why, like, you know, I asked my parents, I was like, well, if, you know, if God created music, how come our songs in church aren't better than this song that John Lennon wrote? <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is blasphemous now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, and, you know, there was that whole idea there was a humanist song, humanistic song. Mm -hmm. I was like, but we're humans. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, this, the the, beginning the, of the no question. heaven line has got to be, that's got to be a little trouble in that. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, you know what you have to do then? I'm sorry, what was your father's name? Uh, everybody called him Bud, but his real name was Cecil Clement. Oh, that's a great name. Uh, yeah, he hated it, but I think it was great. <laughs> okay, yeah, you've got to put the Cecil Clement, uh, Ray Liff, um list on Spotify, all the records you found. Oh, yeah, I mean, he was a huge Van Morrison fan, too. Oh, so. okay. That Which is like see. the early Van, you know, like, I think, you know, it, that really changed me a lot because I, I, my mom listened to it a lot as well. So, you know, it was a lot of moon dance. And then on my own, I found like Astral Weeks and the Bang Sessions. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay. there's a lot of great stuff there. So after he died, did she change what she listened to? Yeah, she kind of like she joined like a CD. <laughs> like, I don't know which, which one of those companies it was, but like got a bunch of stuff like Almond Brothers and, um, the band, I stole her, like, the best of the band CD, which was, like, my introduction. You know, I always thought, as it, you know, like, when you go to a record store and people are like, oh, the best of, but, like, the best of Bob Dylan and the band, like, that was, like, kind of my introduction to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, like, it, it sparked my curiosity. And then I, like, became a record collector and, like, started, you know, thumbing through everything I could get my hands on and, you know, and was lucky enough to, like, find people who had, like, original bootlegs of the basement tapes. And mm -hmm. and that stuff really, like, just kind of changed my life. And those are records that are huge parts of my life now. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember, um, <laughs> do you remember any of the gospel songs you, you sang? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's like a... It's like a, a bad radio station in my head, really. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> what were they? Just just a title or two, so oh, we'll get like, the flavor. Oh, As the Deer is one of the, th I think, is one of the names. Um, Lord, I lift your name on high. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Wow. And my mom actually, she wrote her own songs too. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, and like her own religious songs, and still does. Um, and I guess that's one of those things I'd always love to do for her someday. She's always wanted to make a record. So. We'll wow. Yeah. Do you ever have you ever played one of her songs on stage? I haven't. No. It's for me. It's like a, you know. I feel so far removed from the religious side of things that mm -hmm. um, I don't want to encourage anyone to move that way. <laughs> <laughs> With the power of your voice, you will. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Convert <laughs> millions. millions of people. Yeah. It's the, the conversion is the problem I had. I think that's why I kind of mm -hmm. moved away from it because I was doing some work with the uh, Hopi Native Americans, and um, I was there on an Easter Sunday, and I remember just feeling just embarrassed to be a Christian and to be like trying to force or you know just trying to like minister to people whose beliefs have been around so much longer historically than even mm -hmm. Christianity had been around and I was it really made me question what we were doing and was this in Colorado it, um, no that was in um, the Hopi uh, reservation which is um, in the center of the Navajo reservation which is we came in through Flagstaff, and I believe it's in Nevada. So, mm -hmm. so were you doing like mission work? Yeah, I was. Um, which I, you know, ended up not. You know, I was only I was really I was only eighteen or seventeen or eighteen. So, it's hard to uh, 
be accountable for your decisions at that age, you know, like I was certainly still a kid. learning. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of my uncles was a minister on a, yeah. on a reservation, as we called them in Canada. And it was always very, uh, it's a strange. Yeah. When you say conversion, that's the thing that it's a dangerous word, I feel like, you know, mm-hmm. um, I, I really like some of the other things we did. We worked a lot with uh, Jesus, like feeding homeless people and um, and talking to them like they're really people. Um, and I loved being a part of the Hopi community when I was there and learning about their culture. But I was more interested in learning about their culture than trying to point out what was what. Yeah. You know, try to find something wrong with it. You know, yeah. I was. I love your culture. Now drop it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that was, you know, like, um, that was, you know, the core of Western expansion, you know. Yeah. Well, not even I love your culture, but just like we are eliminated. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Along with, and we like your land. Yeah, we yeah. love your land. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we like that too. Uh, there's a lot of religious language, or at least religious imagery in some of your songs, uh, in Expecting to Lose. You right. Talked about standing in the water. Uh, when you write those, are you are you conscious that that's that it comes from that tradition, or is it just is it just a language you know? Um, it's a language I know, and it's something I always loved about Leonard Cohen's songs. Like he was a Buddhist, but was you know loved the religion he was born into, and but if you listen to his songs, it was like they could be so sensual, but have these like references to. Um, biblical verse and since it's you know such a common I guess that language is so common or so well known at least at one point I feel like it's something people can relate to in in a way Mm -hmm. like you know even like the stand in the water um, the reference of being baptized or something like that we can like if you remove the religious aspect of it you can still have this cleansing idea, you know, um, mm-hmm. that comes along with it. But it, it, I feel like it's a nice reference. It's a nice way to, it's nice vernacular, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So tell me about uh, Richard Swift, who was, yeah, who was uh, a collaborator of yours and a producer on Night Sweats. Yeah, I had met him years ago uh, in London was opening for Delta Spirit, and Matt Vasquez was a good buddy, and we loved Richard Swift's stuff, and that's when I was first introduced to him, but then it kind of took a while for us to circle back to each other, and I had sent him, just randomly sent him demos uh, through the advice of a friend um, of the stuff I was doing in my attic just by myself, which eventually became the Night Sweats. He really liked it and wanted to make a record, and then I ended up having a record deal, and my a and guy suggested I work with him, and I was like, well, we've already decided we wanted to work together. So mm-hmm. um, so I went out to Cottage Grove, Oregon, which is just south of Eugene, where Richard had a studio by myself at first, um, and just had a, a huge batch of songs, and we just kind of started working, you know, like mostly with one mic in the room, but it was like an instant, uh, I don't know, we just had like a kindred spirit, you know, and I know if you talk to anybody that knew Richard, he would... They would probably all say that they felt like he made them feel very special, you know. How did you build those songs? And I don't want to talk about Night Sweat's uh, songs, but were you always hearing those arrangements in your head when you were writing? I mean, I, I tend to have that with a lot of songs that I write, is hearing these other voicings, um, other instruments. And that's kind of part of the fun process, you know, once you get past the chords and the words and melodies um is filling in all those gaps and like figuring out what those other sounds are or you know because sometimes you'll be like oh and horns would be great here and then you try it and you're like that's not that's not the sound that I'm hearing in my head so you keep searching Mm -hmm. so I did that you know I kind of had a lot of that with Richard and even like with the demos um because some of that material ended up being you know uh like songs like you need me uh, was one that I had written um, maybe around that first Night Sweats record, somewhere in there, but just never had a home. It, it reminds me, I mean, maybe it's a lack of imagination on my part, but musicians who can uh, think of just 
you know, without another group of musicians in the room who can who can think of those kind of arrangements for some songs. Um, it reminds me a little of Graham Parker was like that when he started in England. Right. He was this pub rocker, and then he went in and they did a whole. He was like this rhythm and blues guy, and I always right. thought, wow, how does somebody do that? Um, and then turn around and write like you, acoustic songs and right. and. What well, there was a nice thing about working with Richard too, because I I would. I would always have these, you know, like like I said, from the start of the song, there's always these other voicings you hear, these other sounds or instrumentation that you want. But that was really the thing that Richard was so good at is like, uh, even if I had those ideas, sometimes he would be like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Which can be kind of, you know, um, you can get your feelings hurt, but you kind of have to like let go of that. Mm -hmm. and, and know that, like, just try to stay out of the way of the song, you know, mm -hmm. and trust that somebody like Richard was trying to make the song the best it can be. But he would always have that, just these, like, incredible ideas to make a mediocre song be a great song, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and sometimes that was eliminating some of those voices and instrumentation that I thought made the song what it was. So, you know. Yeah. Wow. Did he do the first Night Sweats album? I did the or first and second one. And the second one, okay. Mm -hmm. And then... And then even the EP we did, he ended up like, uh, he mixed and um, I think he added a couple of things to it as well, so... Yeah. yeah. And then sadly, he's gone. And he passed away, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at 41, so wow. pretty, pretty did, young. Did you see him before he... I saw him as soon as I heard he was in the hospital. I flew out there and I just kind of stopped everything. Yeah. And... Um, wanted to be there to I just wanted to know what was happening you know I just knew he was really sick and then um yeah and then and then he pretty quickly went I, I was there for a day and then left and then he quickly went into hospice and I went back again you know to just like I don't know I wanted to shake him and like you know, I wanted him to be coherent and I wanted to talk to him and like you know Trying to make him fight for, for something, I guess you know, mm -hmm. but he wasn't really, it wasn't really coherent by the time I got there. So, uh, are there particular songs written in this album about him? Yeah, you know, and it's still all right. Or there's moments uh, that it's you know, there's moments where I'm talking about him. Rush on in particular is only just is just for specifically Richard and kind of talking to him and sort of about him and that like and I guess you know a lot of the album kind of deals with the same thing that Richard and I shared or or um, I, I guess it's the thing that we all share is this like un, unspeakable or undescribable brokenness that I don't think we allow ourselves to be to be vulnerable enough to talk about to everyone and I just I just kind of question whether you know if we allow ourselves to be able to to vocalize those things and to realize that we all share that sort of similar um, aching that maybe wouldn't be as heavy so I guess like songs like rush on I'm really talking about recognizing that in him but I recognize it in myself as well when did you know you had this voice because uh, you, you do a lot of things in that song, and I mean, right. over your career, I mean, you can sing in a lot of different ways. Um, it took me a while to be comfortable with it, and even, or, like, since my start of a solo career until now, I feel like I've learned so much. Mm -hmm. And part of that process is learning how to be comfortable um, in your voice. How did you do that? I mimicked things for a long time just out of curiosity to see if my voice could do it or like try to understand it and like and I guess this is the kind of thing that I think people take lessons for I was just I don't know if I just didn't have anything else to do <laughs> or what but I mean I was working the whole time so um yeah we should mention that as well as being a working musician you always had a job you like, oh yeah all sorts of crappy ones too so well, but you, you know like, like when you're a janitor trucking, yeah you were a janitor <laughs> i was a janitor when i was 16 for a high school and I, when i didn't go to high school so you didn't go to high school no but my the last janitor. year of school was seventh grade so <clears throat> so then i ended up being like a janitor and groundskeeper and it was kind of embarrassing you know like was, was that the school you would have gone to was it the mm -hmm. local school yeah wow 
Um, I lived tough. in that town, so I should have been going to school there. But then I was like, during the school year, cleaning, either cutting grass there or or, or cleaning the rooms, at, mm-hmm. you know, like sort of a swing shift. But I would always sing. I just kind of, I started to love singing because I love music. And when I was younger, I was really embarrassed of it. But, you know, as I kind of grew out of the church singing into, you know, everything from trying to sing like the Everly Brothers and listen to their harmonies to like um, how Nat King Cole and um, Sam Cooke, how they uh, how they enunciated their words and how they shaped their words. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even into like the early, you know, James Brown, the Fabulous Flames, like the his voice then where he was more of a crooner versus like the funk days. I, I just love the characteristics and all of that. And, you know, and so like how, you know, like, just try to sing like that, you know, like, I guess, you know. Mm. Uh, you had good teachers. I, yeah, 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 I guess so. Those guys were great teachers. Uh, but you also do something that a lot of people don't do so much anymore, um, which is you use almost different voices. I mean, James Brown did do that, but a lot of singers now, I think, feel that I must use my authentic voice, and that's the voice they use for everything. And you're... You'll belt, you'll whisper, you'll do a lot of different things with your voice. I mean, those are all my voice, too. I mean, I, well, yeah, I, I know. I think, I think at, a, at a time I struggled with the identity of what my voice was, mm-hmm. you know, and would, tr- like, on some of the earlier records, I felt like I would stay in, you know, in, like, like, in memory of loss, I feel like my voice is kind of restrained because I'm not taking on different characteristics that I thought mm-hmm. the song needed you know or like songs like all or nothing is like the song i just did is totally different than the other one but i didn't feel like i was singing in a character when i wrote it it seemed like that voice was appropriate for that song mm-hmm. and so i try to listen to that like like shape my voice to what the song requires did you have the songs going in or were a lot of them worked out in the studio i had most of them already demoed and except for uh, all or nothing, or sorry, all or nothing was mostly done, but and it's still all right. I wrote one morning, like I had a, a loose sketch of it, and it's kind of like multiple processes of how I wrote that one. But then just finished it one morning um, before going to the studio, and then recorded it that day. Wow. So, which is a great feeling to like write something and then have it recorded in a matter of hours, and like this was like a real release, you know. So. I guess for someone who wrote songs while being a gardener and yeah. working at a truck depot and all of that, yeah, uh, writing on the road, you know, musicians complain about it. For you, that's like, well, it's still it's still hard for me because there's no personal space on the road, you know. Mm. Um, and there's also when you you know you have seven other goofballs you're hanging out with. There's this energy that consumes a lot of your time which is you just like you know we're we're all really close friends and we all want to hang out and especially even like our crew like you know some of the guys we've been touring with since we were in a van together and now you know we have these big productions and their days are Mm -hmm. really long so at some point you know when you have a day off you're like well what are we going to do together it's not usually i'm going to sit in this room and write all day yeah. it's usually like I'm gonna pour my heart out I don't know can we have like like go to a water park or do something crazy today you know and like all have fun together and <laughs> and so it um <clears throat> but really I'd like to see you and the crew at a water park that could be your next oh side God, project yeah it is a pretty good time yeah it just aren't you <laughs> supposed to have kids for that like with you no, or no, no you can just yeah. go just like a bunch of like slightly intoxic- intoxicated adults yeah yeah in okay. a water park yeah all right <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so you went in, this album has, uh, it's got a really beautiful sound. Thank you. It's a lot, um, I don't know how deliberate it was. It's a, it's at times a very 50s sound. It sounds like a lot of reverb. Am I right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, we kind of try to follow the lines that, um, you know, as we worked with Richard, he would always, um, like even the first record. Like, we would make records for next to nothing with him, so I'd still have a record budget. And then I, he would just be like, man, use that and invest it back into, like, your home recording space. And I was like, mm-hmm. here's the gear you need, which it basically set me up with everything that he had, you know. Um, 
I think out of just laziness, not out of helpfulness, because we were planning on working together a lot, and so he wouldn't want to, like, come over and have the same setup, yeah. you know? He's like, well, if I'm not going to work at my spot, at least your place has all the same stuff. Yeah. So, um, so we ended up with a lot of that kind of sounding stuff. I have, like, a, the AKG BX20 reverb, which is sort of like the... Like, we ran the strings through that, and I, they used that for Frank Sinatra's voice on certain things, and it's just mm-hmm. really rich in... Uh, the BX 15 or 10 and a 25. Um, and so those are all analog reverb units that aren't plate reverbs. Um, mm-hmm. But I love that sound. It's it's hard so, to... So how do they work if it's not a plate? Is it... This actually has a giant coil in it. Like mm-hmm. the BX 20 has a coil that's like four foot. Wow. Um, yeah, they're, they're a real pain if they break. There's really no one to fix them anymore that I know of. Mm-hmm. So... Um, but yeah, it, um, so essentially it sends a signal through this giant spring and then back out the other side. Wow. Um, but yeah, it, it's hard to go. Yeah. I think with the 20, you actually have to use like an effects loop and like be able to control it because the mm-hmm. there's I no way to reduce it. It's just like all verb or none. So yeah. yeah. By the way, we're in a studio here, and I can see all the guys in the booth. They're all on eBay now, seeing if there's old, uh, oh, good luck old coils. Those, yeah, is there, good uh, luck finding the BX15 or 10. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah, there's a lot of fakes out there, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other side of the album, uh, they're not going to hear it here, but I hope everybody gets this album and listens, is there's a lot of, uh, a lot of voice, a lot of like choral right. uh, voicings in it. Um, which I'm assuming you brought in people to do that. That's not well. Like tonight, number two is just me and Patrick. Oh, is that right? Doing all. I know everybody's like, "Oh, you got a choir here." I was like, "No, well, there's two of us." Yeah. I'm just actually just keep layering it, doing different harmonies on top of each other. Mm-hmm. First, at first, doing it one on one, and then just like standing in the studio with four twenty ones, like singing into them while we're listening to the playback together. So. Wow. Well, yeah. it sounds great. Thank you. And you've got a lot of strings. And I think you're touring with strings, right? Yeah, we have a quartet with us. We we did like one night where we did three songs, and we brought in like a, I think it was nine or ten strings players. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it was kind of like the, I had just finished the studio at my house, and I was like, well, this is definitely the test of what we can do in here. And we ended up pulling it off and getting the songs done. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so... Yeah, those uh, musicians' unions. You're paying a lot of money for those yeah. guys. Yeah, um, but there's a lot of, like, Mellotron strings. Um, I feel like that was um, one of Richard's secret weapons, too. Um, the modern Mellotrons are pretty nice. I don't know. It worked for the Beatles and the Beach Boys, so I don't know why it would work now, you mm-hmm. know. So, yeah. um, but it's got a nice... It gives the album this very nice late 60s folk right on. records. You remember, it was, it was usually the not very good folk artists who suddenly had like symphony orchestras behind them. Right. I uh, mean, even, but the, this is really beautiful. The five leaves left record. Uh, Nick Drake has like tons of orchestration on oh, it too. Yeah. But like, you know, even uh, like Leonard Cohen songs of Leonard Cohen, like there's some orchestration on there, but then there's these just arrangements of like really weird sounding instruments that like float in for a minute and then they're gone. I've always mm-hmm. loved that stuff, though. Yeah, like... he, he uses a, a jaws harp on, uh, mm-hmm. I can't remember which song, but it's all of a sudden you're like, is this a joke song? Because you hear the twang, twang yeah. in the background. <laughs> and then it just kind of fades out. Yeah. Um, thank, yeah thanks so much for coming in. My pleasure. You know, I hope we me. play this, and I hope people at your church are like, how did we lose that guy? Uh, We've got to um... get him back. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can dream.